Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Give me Jesus, Lord. Give me Jesus. You can have all the rest. Just give me Jesus. Amen. Some time ago, a friend of mine decided that in that particular year at Christmas, he was going to do something special that would be a real faith-lifting experience for his family. And what he did was he went out and he bought a manger set, just similar to this, bought a manger set. And he set it up in the family room because he wanted to teach his children the real meaning of Christmas. Now, he didn't buy an expensive uh, manger. He bought a rather cheap manger. He bought a manger that had plastic figures to it. And there was a reason for that. Because he wanted the children to be able to pick up the figures and to hold them in their hands and to be able to take the opportunity to play with them and to kind of get a feel for what this was all about, what was going on in this manger scene, and to get to know a little bit about the characters that were in the manger. And he did that about three weeks before Christmas, but the acid test came one week before Christmas because he went into the family room where the manger scene was set up and he gathered the children around. And he said, now, what I want you to do is I want you to take a look at these figures and I want you to tell me a little bit about what, what we have here. And immediately they began to talk about, you know, the shepherds and how it was that they had been out in the field and looking after the sheep. So they They picked up one of the sheep and they held it and they they showed it. And then they they picked up the angel and they talked about how the angels came and sang to the shepherds announcing Jesus' birth. And then they talked about uh, the wise men and how they had come and the camels. They loved the camels and they would hold the camels a lot. And then they talked about the farm animals that were there uh, in the manger the sheep and the goats, and then they mentioned, of course, Mary and the baby. But the father said, now wait a minute. Aren't you leaving somebody out? Who is this figure that is standing next to Mary? And there was a silence. And finally, the five-year-old son responded, Oh, yeah, I I know. That's old Joseph, Joe What's-His-Name. And the children inadvertently point out a fascinating phenomenon about Christmas. And that is that we tend to forget about Joseph. I, I call Joseph the forgotten man of Christmas. You see, in the Bible, Joseph stands silent. You know, he's, he's talked about, he's talked to, but Joseph never utters a single syllable. And because of that, we have this tendency to think that Joseph is uh, one of these minor players in the Christmas drama. And over the years, we have consciously, and I I expect unintentionally, ignored uh, him, and we have relegated him to the the background of the Christmas story. But today, today, I wish to bring Joseph front and center in a place that I believe that he absolutely belongs. 
while Joseph never spoke a word in Scripture, the way he lived his life speaks absolute volumes about the Christian lifestyle and, and Christian action. And that's why he needs to be uh, remembered and acknowledged. Remember, please, that the first Christmas was not a time of sweetness and light. That we, this is how we sometimes portray Christmas. All of the beautiful things about it, the angels. and it's, This was not a time of sweetness and light. This was a, a time of darkness and, and brutal confrontation. This was a very difficult time in the world at that particular point. It was this bare impact of it all. This is what Joseph faced as he came into the scene. He was just an ordinary workman. He was a simple carpenter. And he got caught up in this confluence of events that would have absolutely torn him apart had not God been in the midst of it with him. He faced emotional distress. I mean, how was he going to deal with this potentially disastrous, unexpected pregnancy of Mary? And he had to face physical challenges because Herod, this crazy king, this jealous king, sent soldiers out to pursue him in order to try to kill his son. In the face of all that, Joseph's faith and courage and obedience and strength sustained him. And that is why I believe we need to see Joseph not as some sideline player in the background, but Joseph as a star on the Christmas stage. You know, the way he combined toughness and tenderness is a lesson for all of us here in this place this morning. Joseph was tough. He was tough enough to make tough decisions. He was tough enough to face the opposition that was challenging him. Tough enough to obey the Lord when he knew that it was going to cost him. We see it right from the very first moment he enters into Scripture. He's got this woman this, that he's in, engaged to who comes up pregnant. And he's not the father. And so this was a potential profound problem for Joseph. And the Bible says, well, he considered this. It makes it out like it's all just so simple. So easy that he feels he's going to find a way. But the real meaning of that in the scriptures was that he struggled, he deliberated, he wrestled, he grieved, he prayed. But Joseph was tough enough to face the tough problem. So let me ask you, what do you do when you confront a tough issue in your life. You get angry, you throw up your hands and want to quit. Or like Joseph, do you stand up and face it with God's help and move forward? I read a story about a politician who was giving a speech to uh, a crowd and he was trying to get them to consider voting for him. And it was a rousing speech. And at the very end, he made the loud appeal. Now, I want you to go out on Tuesday. Go to the polls, and I want you to vote for me. And there was a heckler in the crowd. And the heckler in the crowd said, I wouldn't vote for you if you were St. Peter. And the politician answered just like that. If I was St. Peter, you wouldn't be in my district. Think about that. I wish that, you know, sometimes I could think of the quick answers and like that. 
But when I face a problem or a struggle, I have to kind of sort through it, think about it. I have to lean into it with prayer to find the courage. Last night, um, I was mulling over the sermon, and uh, of all places, I was outside grilling something for dinner, and I was thinking about it. And I looked over to my right, and we have this huge avocado tree. It's not very fruitful. We're getting about seven or eight avocados out, it, out of it now, but it's still young. Maybe that will increase as time goes by. And yet when uh, Hurricane Ian hit, all of the avocados that I had counted on the tree, and I, tried, I counted just about every one of them that were there, I went out after Ian and all of the heavy winds of it had, had blown so hard against that tree. And here were these avocados. And they were all on the ground. And I said, well, there goes that. You know, it's like, first it's the squirrels, and then it's a hurricane. And so uh, I thought, well, that's the end of that. But last night, I don't know why, but I just felt this need to go walk up up to that avocado tree and take another look. And there, behind some really dark green leaves, was this lone avocado that was hanging from a thin stem. And I thought to myself, what a tremendous metaphor. Here, the avocados in that tree were shaken by this belting wind and storm. It, it just hit so hard against that tree, and so many fell to the wayside. But this one avocado with that thin stem that was connected to the tree was still nourished and strengthened to withstand. And so when we face the problems that we encounter in life, we need to be like that lone avocado and, and try to maintain our connection to the Father. And then there's the strength to be able to go on. And that's what Joseph did. The, the winds beat against him so horribly. And yet he never gave up, he never quit, he never cursed about it. He never tried to point the finger of blame to anyone else. He just stood up and soaked in the strength of God. He was tough, and we need to be tough with the help of God. Joseph was tough, but Joseph was also tender. Just look at the way that he dealt with Mary, how lovingly he dealt with her in that situation where she found her, herself. This was a horrible situation for a woman back then. And also think about the tenderness with which he dealt with Jesus, and I don't want you to miss that. When Jesus grew up, he called God Father. He called God Father. Father, when Jesus wanted to say the best and the highest thing that he could about God, he said, God is like a loving, understanding Father. Is it not reasonable to assume that what Jesus learned about a Father that he learned from Joseph himself. You know the cliches, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. The words remind us of this relationship that Jesus and Joseph must have had as 
Jesus was growing up there in Nazareth, Nazareth with Joseph and Mary. And there was something about that relationship that Joseph had with Jesus that later called, uh, caused Jesus to refer to God as Father. How it must have been. Here's Jesus, little boy, and he goes running into the carpenter shop. You know, like little boys will do. Just full of energy and just yapping away, you know, just talking about one thing. And here's Joseph. He stops what he's doing, puts down the tools. He sits and he, he talks with Jesus about anything in the world that he wants to talk about. And he watches as Jesus wallows around in the sawdust and he gets, you know, he gets uh, chips of wood in, in his long flowing black hair. And I think it was because of that access that Jesus had to Joseph. And the way Joseph responded to him, that Jesus would later, later say, never prohibit the children from coming unto me. And did they go on long walks in the fields around Nazareth? And saw there the, the, the wild flowers that were growing. Then they stopped to pick some of them and to take them to, to Mary back home. And was this the reason later on that Jesus would remember that? And he would say, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. Even Solomon in all of his glory is not arrayed like one of these. And as they walked together, did Joseph tell Jesus about what it was like when he was a boy and how the army of Herod had pursued them and were seeking to catch him and to kill him? So that then Jesus began to tie this concept of fatherhood to courage and bravery. As they climbed higher in the nearby hills and they saw the springs of water that were flowing, turning the desert into luscious green all around them like an oasis. Was it then that Jesus began to think of springs of living water flowing in our hearts? Reaching the summit, they could see the caravan routes that were coming from multiple different directions. And maybe it was then that Jesus remembered it before he ascended. And he said to his disciples, go into all of the world and make disciples of all nations. The lovely tenderness with which Jesus saw Joseph deal with Mary. Was that what led the Master to exalt womankind to the highest possible level, a, never, a level never before seen and would not be seen for a long, long time? When Jesus spoke of talents, both money and ability, and how to use our talents, did that come from him watching Joseph in the carpenter shop honing the skills that he possessed to do the finest possible work? And then later on he would say so beautifully, take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Yes, I think that's how it must have been. If you ever have the opportunity to go to Paris, or maybe you've been to Paris and been to the Louvre, there is a 17th century painting there by Georges de la Tour, and it's entitled, St. Joseph 
in the carpenter's shop. We have that. In this, Joseph is working away. And the only other person there is Jesus, about 10 or 11 years old. He's holding a candle as Joseph works away on that wood. He looks attentively at the graying, at the graying Joseph working on that intractable material and shaping it by hand. It's a lovely painting, but you may miss, unless you look for it, that in the shadows at the bottom, and it's hard to see because of the amber tones of the painting, Joseph is building a cross. And I wonder if it may have been in that carpenter shop as he watched Joseph working that Jesus was marked with the obedience that would take him to the cross. Don't forget that when Jesus wanted us to know what God was like, he said, God is like a tender, loving, understanding Father. I think it's safe to say that Jesus learned that from Joseph. Well, <clears throat> it's, uh, we're heading to Christmas. Let me share a thought that sometimes pops up in, in my head. Sometimes I envision myself standing before God's throne. And in between me and God's throne, there is a scale, there's a balance scale. That is there. And on the left hand, the left hand side, the devil is heaping all of my sins onto that scale. And it's a big pile. Keeps throwing them on, throwing them on. And on the right hand side, the angels are trying to find anything righteous about my life. And on that side, it's, let's just say it's kind of weak. And so the scale is really tipped against me. And I seem doomed. But then I hear the sound of the clink of metal. Clink. And again, clink. It is the sound of nails hitting the scale. Clink. And I don't know whether those nails came from a cross on Calvary or whether they came from a stable, a manger in Bethlehem. But I do know this. The balance is tipped. And by the grace of Jesus Christ, I am saved. And what is true for me is true for you as well. What was it that King Lear said? He said, it is the stars, the stars above that govern our condition. No, Lear, you're wrong. It is a star, one star, Christ's star. God's star shining in the midst of this storm-tossed world in which we live. That is what governs our condition. It shapes our lives. It determines our destiny. For that star speaks to us of God, our tender, loving, saving, heavenly Father. And we learn about that Father from Jesus. And Jesus learned about it from Joseph. And that, my beloved, is why I, 
think. Joseph needs to be a star on the Christmas stage. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this morning and for this season of Advent where we have the opportunity to take a look again at the coming of your Son into this, this world and what that means to us for hope the hope of salvation, the hope of new life, the the hope of empowerment to be able to stand tall and face whatever storms or hardships or difficulties come our way. To know that we are loved by God so profoundly that Jesus came. May that truth resound in our hearts today and as we leave this place. For we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen.